because I don't want to go backwards. I want to keep going forward together. That's exactly where we're going to go. I'm Steve Walters. And I'm J.R. Ross. This is Rewind, Wisconsin's Eye Summary of This Week in the Capitol. We are in the season of omnibus packages. <laughs> and that 29-page education package that came out at 8 p.m. Tuesday, I thought, now you and I have been doing this a long time, I thought that was still pretty amazing. Agree, J.R.? Uh, it was a Christmas tree for some people. You know, I mean, you put all the presents in there you want. But in reality, there's so many moving parts in education, you're kind of making choice fit with K-12, and yeah. the money goes here and there. So in some ways it makes sense. Now it also, to be honest in, in terms of efficiency, they limited debate on motions to 10 minutes per motion, yep. so you could, or per paper, so you could go all these papers and go 10 minutes per person at a time or do it all in one shot. Now, I think they gave a little more time yesterday in the omnibus motions, but in some ways it makes it go easier for the majority party, which, you know, that's how it's always been done. But the public and reporters don't see it till 8 p.m. on Tuesday, and then it's adopted five hours later, and it affects how we pay for K-12 education mm -hmm. in public, charter, private, even it virtual schools. Changes the, we're seeing school board elections to go yep. from at-large seats to nine districts. Yeah. Uh, it requires districts or school boards to allow kids who are homeschooled or private schooled in their district to play sports. Yep. So ex extracurricular activities. I talked to WIA executive director this week, said, we were founded 120 years ago because of this issue where schools were allowing kids who weren't part of the school to play, yeah. and that's a big issue for us. Now, we also made the point of if you're a small school in Wisconsin and you are struggling already, but you offer football and the private school next door doesn't, you are so attractive to a kid because of that. If you can go next door and still play football, it's one less reason to go to your school. So now, yeah. will that play out? Will kids abandon these public schools because of sports? Who knows? But it's the fear of change. It's the fear of the unknown of what could happen, and that's... So the choice program. Well, you just pointed out that, that it's Christmas tree. So let's just go through one by one ten major provisions. Okay, it restores 127 million in K-12 aid next year that the governor's budget had cut. The governor offered that budget in February. He's since come around, and everybody was saying we are going to restore this money. It's just mm -hmm. a matter of where they were, where they were going to find it. Oh, and the argument has been for public as well. Governor, if you really were four schools from the start, why don't you fund them in the first place? Yep. <laughs> yeah, that's true. And they also said, we're going to boost uh, K-12 funding by $69 million in the second year. Um, so they're able to say, we not only restore the governor's cut, but we're going to boost it in the second year. And the Democrats are quick to point out, well, okay, that $200 million you're putting to schools is misleading because you're also now taking the the choice program mm -hmm. statewide and we're seeing mm -hmm. and patterning after the open enrollment program which means of that 200 million a chunk is going to go to private chunk. schools. That's right. That's right. Which is the second item here. Lifts the 1,000 student cap on voucher program outside uh, City of Milwaukee and Racine. However, there's a limit. Up to 1% of each student in the district can, can be a choice. So the first 10 years and the cap goes away. And then the cap goes away. The bigger thing is going to be the, the formula for funding it. Yeah. The choice advocates were not happy with Governor Walker's budget because what he wanted to do was, okay, you go to Beloit, X number of dollars go with you because you're in a, a poor district. You go to Menominee Falls, why dollars go with you because you're a wealthier district. Much richer. We're going to pull all that money into one pot and then yep. give you an average voucher, which you wouldn't notice how the voucher was until after all the kids were, you know, in the program, in the yep. pot. Yep. They wouldn't have been enough to fund the voucher, the cost of education that kid. Right. So they weren't happy with it. This is a much better formula for choice advocates. Yes. And John Niger and the coach argued it's also better for the schools because because of the formula for open enrollment, the districts don't lose all of that money mm -hmm. because of the taxing authority they get and the, the formulas. So in some ways, it's a little bit of a less of a hit, if you will, for the public school. But let's actually look at those numbers. It provides $7,200 per K-8 K student, $7,800 per high school student in the voucher program. And then going back to what you said earlier, uh, yeah, the Fiscal Bureau paper says it's a hit of $48 million in public schools, but there's some l offsets, I'm told, by the Fiscal Bureau. Moving parts, so it's hard to know. It. Yeah. Until you get an actual run per district, it'll be hard to know. And how many kids will leave each district, it's going to be a little bit of a wild card in that regard to know what the true impact is per school. And um, as it was debated two years ago, here comes the voucher program again for K-12 students with disabilities. Mm -hmm. That is a very emotional issue. Very emotional, and the Democrats are quick to point out that the... Uh, groups who represent kids with disabilities don't like it. We have a very vocal group of people who really want it very badly. Yes. So it's been a fight for the last couple of years. It's been hung up in the Senate. It wouldn't go along with it, I believe, last couple of times. So they put it in. Now the question is, will it stay in once it gets to both houses? 
to be determined. Okay. And then next, let's, this is a new one. I didn't see this one coming. Let's Milwaukee County Executive Chris Abley name an overseer for up to three failing schools in the 2016-2017 school year. That number could go to five in mm -hmm. the following school year. And each year after that. It also, the, the provision also opens a door for Racine and Madison to end up being subject to a similar system going forward. Now the idea is from Kienga and Darling that Milwaukee Public Schools have been failing for a long time. Yep. The Choice Program, you know it's better than I, was founded 20 years ago to force Milwaukee to compete, MPS to compete with private schools, yes. and it would force improvements. Yes. That has not happened. Yes. So the status quo is not working in their minds. They want to do something different. This creates a, a new avenue of taking failing schools and okay, MPS is not doing the job, we're gonna do it this way. Now, for MPS and Democrats, you're taking over our schools uh, through an unelected commissioner who'll be appointed by the county executive. Yes. Um, how's that really local control? And why are you doing this to us? Also, I don't think they completely vetted this with Chris Abley, do you? I uh, think this was kind of a surprise to the Milwaukee County Executive. I'm not sure, but it's a surprise definitely Madison and, Milwaukee, uh, Madison and Green Bay mm -hmm. would also be part of this potentially. Now, there are several criteria you have to meet before you get into the this system have established. Yes. But Madison and, I th and Racine have hit a couple of them. If they are have failing marks for a couple of years in a row, they could be in the same kind of system. They could be there unless this program is re rewritten in two years, three years, four years. Or vetoed or whatever. Uh, it's to be determined, but again, in, will they go to other cities? If this works, will they go elsewhere and begin the process of, of doing this? It's, a, it's basically a takeover school. Now remember, this isn't the first time it's been proposed. Governor Doyle, Mayor Barrett talked about a takeover of MPS. Uh, what was that, five, well, seven years ago? A little bit different system. Tommy in the late 90s wanted to break up MPS. I, yes, so the idea is not new. It's a new vehicle to do it, and it's the same complaint. I mean, the teachers' union was not happy with Governor Doyle. We talked about this a few years back. They're not happy about this idea either. Neither is MPS. They feel like they're being picked on. Well, and, and my nominee for the thing I least expected to be part of this package requires high school students to pass a civics test to graduate. This is the idea of freshman representative uh, Jimmy Boy Edming. Mm -hmm. It's had one public hearing. Mm -hmm. That public hearing was very, very interesting. Um, I'm very surprised this is in there. Are you, are, do you share my surprise? Uh, I do know that Speaker Voss was a big fan of the idea. Okay. Now, it begs a question. When's it kick in? Uh, what happens if you fail? Do you take three times, five times, six times? You right. know, all these kinds of rules. Now, here's the thing. With anything in education, there's a law that you pass, and the rules DPI promulgates to make it work. So okay. that'll be a big question, too. What's DPI say how it works? What if I... Uh, do I take it 10 times? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you, know, you can retake and retake. Uh, you start your sophomore year, right? You have to take the test the first time or something I, like that? I'm not up to speed, but here, JR, I, I'm going to give you a test. Okay. Here's one question. The Department of Homeland Security, naturalization self-test. Self Here's the first question. What do we call the first 10 amendments to the Constitution? A, Bill of Rights. Two, the in, inalienable rights. Three, the Articles of, of Confederation. Four, the Declaration of Independence. Do, do, Bill do. of Rights. Okay, thank you. Moving on. Thank God's multiple choice, right? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Prohibits DPI Superintendent Tony Evers from promoting common core standards. That's no big surprise. No. Now, the message that John Erpenbach had during the hearing was, wait, Governor Walker's been touring the, the country saying we're going to repeal common core. Does that really repeal common core? So, but yeah, I mean, Republicans are not happy with that system at all. You also have some Democrats, not big fans. So, so that there, have that in there is not a surprise at all. Right. Let's high school students graduate of half of their credits from a learning portfolio. What is a learning portfolio? And when you were in high school, did you build one? Because I didn't. <laughs> I took what I had to graduate. I understand. And get out of there so I go to college. I understand. <laughs> um, so that's, but... Uh, Let's land here. Um, choice remains one of the most mm -hmm. divisive issues. Choice in the city of Milwaukee. It's mm -hmm. been around 25 years, 20, 25 years. And this exchange between Senator Lena Taylor and State Representative Dale Coinga, uh, she accused the legislature, not just this one, but past legislatures, of raping Milwaukee children. So and people on the committee. That's true. So let's listen to that exchange here for uh, a, a few seconds. Quit giving us the hypocrisy of double standards and just give us what's due us. That's it. Nothing more, nothing less. Just what's due us. Well, I just want to point out, when you were in charge of this committee, you didn't deal with this issue. And when we were on this committee, we dealt with this issue. For years, 
individuals who sit on this committee and in this building have known that they have been raping the children of MPS. This is the second time in a conversation we've had on these issues, one publicly in UWM and now here. We use the word rape. So, I mean, I just find that sick. Just absolutely sick. Uh, second of all is, I'll take you at your word that you made efforts legislatively to do something on this. I take you at your word. And I'm just grateful that my Republican leadership is more supportive of my concern on this issue than your Democrat leadership was to you when you brought the issue. So, I get it. The word rape sounds offensive. But when you consider the fact that 15 out of 100 kids can read on grade level while $89 million have been skimmed from the education of kids. That's what is disgusting and d despicable. JR, that was a pretty raw exchange mm -hmm. between the only legislator from the city of Milwaukee and uh, Representative Coinga. And that just shows how, as they approach these major, major decisions, we're going to hear more of these major disagreements in next week, aren't we? What's interesting, too, about the Choice Program is when it was founded 25, 20 years ago, it was a coalition of African-American Democrats in and Milwaukee. And Ed Polly Williams she was, was the leader. real champion of it, and Tommy Thompson, Republicans outstate. Democratic Party has never been a big fan. Right. One question choice advocates have, where have all the African-American Democratic lawmakers who back school choice gone? They're not there anymore. There's not a huge support for choice program in the Milwaukee delegation anymore. That's one that's changed a great deal. Um, You're talking just, about the Jason Fields. Yeah. They're gone. Excuse those guys. Me, go and they're, and they, they've been targeted in elections. And if you have Scott Jensen, who's part of one of the groups, pro-school pro voucher groups, yes. when they, he goes in and helps Democrats in these primaries, that's singled out as a bad thing in these primaries anymore. It is but a big change in the dynamic. And now for Democrats, they'll argue that, look, you're creating a separate system. You are slowly draining Milwaukee of resources because remember the funding flaw they've yes. had for years? Yes. Part of that exchange that Lena was having the was money about is subtracted from MPS the school hundreds days. of millions of dollars MPS that the Milwaukee has lost because of the said funding 89 flaw. Million. Yeah. Uh, well, even bigger than that is that the property tax flaw, You're right. all these things that go into it, this is part of what she was talking about. You're right. Okay. What's your what's your nominee for the biggest surprise in the GOP schools GOP schools package? Probably the thing that I wasn't expecting most: uh, revamping an entire school district's election process. That was different. Yeah, by the speaker and by Senator Van uh, Wangard. I was. I think people were a little surprised that Madison and Racine were included in the recovery package. I mean, I talked to you, potentially. Dale. Yes, potentially. I talked to Dale pre previously, and he had mentioned they were going to do this. That had been kind of known that he and Alberta were working this, this program, but that it was going to also include those two. It was a little bit. Okay. Something I was expecting. Okay. Um, my nominee for the one that doesn't make it in the final budget is a civics test. Do you have a nominee? Ooh, I hate predicting vetoes. Okay. I pass. <laughs> Let's talk about two other things quickly that Joint Finance did. Uh, they approved drug testing mm -hmm. for unemployment benefits and job training. Uh, that will rely on getting a federal waiver. Do I have that right? Uh, most of them, yes. So there's one of them that they said, don't apply for the waiver, go ahead and start doing the rules. So it's going to be interesting to watch. Are there any repercussions? Will the Fed say yes? What happens with this kind of stuff? And then the Democrats also argue, look, you're going to spend all this money and find a very small percentage of people who are you know, positive. So what's the point? But yeah. for Republicans, again, it's about we need people who can get fill these jobs. The governor talked about the convention last weekend. We are, and Lieutenant Governor, there are 80-some thousand jobs available right now in Wisconsin if you are qualified. Part of the qualifications usually is you're drug-free. If you're not drug-free, you can't get a job this is a problem. And we have all kinds of employers saying, I've got openings, I can't find people to pass a drug test. Right. What's going on? And so, Finally, in joint finance uh, this week, uh, Senior Care started, I think, in 2003. Mm -hmm. Very popular program. 85,000 uh, elderly, low income, paid $30 a year. That hasn't changed. Not a decade, no. 12 right. years. That hasn't been changed. And they pay $5 for generics as their copay, $15 for the other drugs. And it's so popular, and AARP and other groups mounted such pushback that they said, senior care, hear us, you 85,000 people and your relatives and your advocates, it's not going to change. What was interesting was at one point, you know, Governor Walker originally proposed was, if you're in senior care, you have to apply for Medicare Part D. If you qualify, you have to enroll. Yes. Republicans said early on, we're not going to do that. What they did talk about, though, was possibly raising the enrollment fee yes. or co-pays to try and bring the cost of the program. Uh, last couldn't, week, couldn't the, even do that. Last week, the convention, one of the 
uh, operatives who spoke to delegates said, seniors vote. I'll give you two guesses why they took care of seniors <laughs> <laughs> with this program and said it's not worth the headache. I mean, yes, uh, Republicans, would, if you talk to them the last couple of weeks, they said, hey, I've talked to people in my district, and they've said 30 bucks is cheap. Mm -hmm. I'd pay 100 You know, I'd be okay with that. Yep. When a push came to shove, it wasn't worth the pain to do something At like one that. point, Speaker Voss floated a trial balloon. balloon. Let's, we could even potentially triple the $30 annual mm -hmm. fee. Well, that didn't go anywhere, and senior care is not going to change one iota. It's become like a, a fourth rail in Wisconsin. Yeah, it has. That's a very good analogy. Let's talk about Weedick. Um, mm -hmm. This this is an agency under siege. Let's kind of go through a timeline. There's a second audit. Uh, audit, excuse me. Weedick fails to comply with fails to monitor the job creation requirements. Can't follow state law. State Journal does a pretty good story. Mm -hmm. It says that former DOA Secretary Mike Hipsch personally lobbied for a loan to the business of a Governor Walker campaign contributor. This is in 2011. This is only months after the governor is reelected, months after this campaign contributor wrote the maximum 10K check. Then, then Democrats asked the U.S. Justice Department, this happened this week, to investigate the eventual 500,000 unpaid, unsecured loan given to the business operated by that campaign contributor. And then just yesterday, Joint Finance goes along with the governor's recommendation, take me off the board, and Joint Finance, did they approve it yesterday, or will they approve the idea of no longer giving loans to specific companies? They took him off the board, and they grabbed the $55 million he proposed for loans. They I mean, put that, it in a pot, right? Yes, they okay. put that in a pot to spend elsewhere. Um, what's interesting is, even if you ask the governor's administration, they'll tell you the agency has not been, was not well run initially. They had all kinds of problems. There was a foundational problem getting Weedick off the ground. Continual churn of, of uh, CEOs and oh, executives? Just all kinds of things because they had a short window. Remember, the governor used the budget to change commerce into Weedick. Right. There was no real time for transition. That created a poor foundation. Right. They will also will say that there were problems from the Dole administration grabbing bad commerce department loans into Weedick that they inherited, then became part of the problem. The thing is, they've never been able to get their head above water and fix the issue and get out ahead of the, the bad publicity. It has right. been an albatross for Governor Walker for months. It's a fascinating development that just three months ago, he's saying merge it with WIDA and make forward Wisconsin, this new development authority that would really streamline and make more efficient our economic development efforts. Two weeks ago, he says, drop the merger. A week ago, he says, drop the loans, put the money in tax credits. I didn't put it in tax credits. They're basically stripping down Weedick because it is a problematic agency. Now, for Democrats, it is a pinata oh, anymore. It is a shooting gallery. They can take off. The bigger question for Governor Walker nationally is this becomes an issue nationally. What we see yesterday, he has not created 250,000 new jobs his first term. He got yep. barely halfway there. He got 129,000, right. His flagship agency to create jobs has been uh, the story that Chris Taylor talked about in finance was cronyism, incompetence. Uh, that's the story of Wiedek and Herma. It's an easy, and even Dean Knudsen, a Republican from Hudson, said, I had questions about creation of the agency in general. Should we be doing this in the first place? Right. It is just a, a problem for him, and they cannot get it fixed. But let's, let's, let's go a little bit deeper. Did the governor want to be the chairman of Wiedek um, so he could tout the eventual two, creation of 250,000 jobs? And now that he fell short of that by almost half, he wants off? Good question. Or did uh, you saw the releases? You heard the Democrats say he the governor he was fired, yeah. and Alberta Darling said no. The governor had decided that if as long as he's chair of Weedick, he became too much of a attack, and it became too much of a RD. What's the real story? Good question. Uh, the Democrats were unhappy because remember, his original plan was to pull all elected officials off the Weedick board. Period. Yep. yep. Lawmakers weren't happy because they don't like being taken out of oversight roles, right? And they always vote to give themselves more oversight in the joint finance process, mm -hmm. and often it's vetoed out in the final budget. But in this case, uh, the separate bills, because Wilmer Walker put in the budget, then asked for separate legislation to work on it outside of the budget. In that bill, it took him off and kept them on. Um, you know, John Robach's words yesterday were, if he wants off, he's running away. So he can't win with Democrats no matter what. Right. You know, which, which, which goes back to my question. Is this going to become a big issue for, for once he announces as a presidential candidate? I've already seen the New York Times write about it this week. It is going to be an issue. It is an issue for him. Because what's he running on? I've taken on the unions. I've implemented conservative reforms in Wisconsin. We have a Wisconsin turnaround. Yep. The place, I think his words this week were that Wisconsin was a mess when we took over. 
Well, now his flagship job agency is still a mess. A mess. You know, four years later, yeah. that's a problem for him. And you know, Donald Trump, I think I saw something you know, raised question about Walker and the number, the amount of bonding in Wisconsin, the debt the state's piled up. I mean, you can pick apart various things Walker has done as mm -hmm. governor and mm -hmm. try and question, raise the question of, well, how effective have you been? Are you really that big, is it really that big of a Wisconsin turnaround while you've been governor? Good point. Let's pivot to the courts. The targets of our John Doe investigations had asked the U.S. Supreme Court to get involved. Last week, the U.S. Supreme Court said, we ain't going there. This means that whether John Doe, well, am I saying this right? Whether John Doe investigations continue or are shut down is an issue now pending before our state Supreme Court? Yes, there's also a separate lawsuit in Waukesha County Court. But the Supreme Court, remember the Supremes, they don't take a lot of cases. No, you're talking U.S. Supreme US Court. Supremes. Go. They are petitioned thousands of times a year and take yeah. a small percentage. So the fact they didn't take this one case, not that much of a shock, especially with a case pending in state court. Yes. Remember the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals said when they when they rejected the Randa decision, overturned it, was this should have been left in state court. Well, now we've got the state court decision. It could come out any day now from the uh, state Supreme Court justice saying, okay, one, this investigation go forward. Was there a foundation for it? All these issues about campaign finance law and is coordination between candidates and issue groups, not express issue group, is that allowed? That's yes. you know heart of the case, and we'll find out from the court well, what it thinks. Um, thanks, because here's my question. Are all the briefs in? Is that truly a ruling that we could see any day now? Uh, they, they released everything last week that was redacted. I believe everything is in. Okay. There have been rumblings it could come, but again, it's like anything. The court operates in its own uh, time frame. June 30th is usually the last day for decisions to come End out. End of the term, yes. Yes, we've got one month and eight days yeah. uh, left before it should, it should be out. It was interesting. Um, I was able to interview Chief Justice Roganzak and just asked her a basic question. Have you talked to former Chief Justice Shirley Abramson and, uh, personally? And she said, no, while this lawsuit is pending, um, maybe feelings are a little too harsh <laughs> for that. Uh, that, that. That was interesting. She also said there was this... Marquette University Law School grads come in and are sworn in, and it's a happy time. And Roganzak said she got emails from Abramson, Justice Ann Walsh Bradley, and Pat Crooks uh, saying we're not going to be there. And so that was, do you think that was a boycott or were they pouting? Good question. I can't see the emails yet to know what the reasoning was. Okay. But, but it was it, a public snub. It did give conservatives the opportunity to tee off and Justice Abramson and say, you know, this is classless, this is tacky, she should have been there. Yeah. This is not the way you operate if sure. you're justice of the Supreme Court, okay. especially when it's a happy occasion for college grads. Now, same time, the dean said, hey, they've missed these things before. So, But kind of a coincidence, all three of the ones from the, the Abramson kind of right. like coalition, if you will, all right. missed the same time. Okay, and this is the last time, new subject, we're going to talk about the 70, mi 70 miles <laughs> per hour speed limit, but there is a map of where it will be going into effect. That the governor signed that. That's one thing that affects us all. I might be tempted later today as I go north to break that 65 Remember, miles per Remember, not the signs are posted. I know, late <laughs> June or early July. But two trivia questions, Jr. What was the year that w uh, Wisconsin adopted the 65 mile per hour limit? Do 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 oh, do do. 1996. Oh, college. Yeah, <laughs> and <clears throat> and the first law setting the speed limit was passed in 1947. Before 1947, it was unlawful to operate a, a vehicle, quote, carelessly and heedlessly with wanton disregard for the safety of others. Um, if you're going out of town, Jr., as you just said, you can't do 70 yet. <laughs> Not yet. Not yet. And now they have the interstates, but the DOT is still taking time on the four-lane state highways yes. a la uh, uh, Wisconsin 41, for example, yeah. between Milwaukee and Appleton, that might be a prime because there are no at-grade crossings, so okay. it will speed there, too. Now let's draw. Let's talk uh, presidential politics. Mm -hmm. So you and I covered the governor in uh, La Crosse, mm -hmm. state convention. He then went to Iowa. Iowa. Then New Orleans. Mm -hmm. Yesterday, Oklahoma City. He was in D.C. on Wednesday. I, thank you for the correction. Please? I missed the D.C. Mm -hmm. Well, any major updates on his uh, soon-to-be-announced whatever Likely presidential campaign? It's fascinating. I mean, he's saying all along, after the budget, after the budget. So we're getting close. Um, the betting money is he's going to announce he is running. So I don't think he's going to say no. But uh, it's fascinating that he's getting this really rotten reception in Wisconsin right now and a great one nationally. So he goes to New Orleans, big reception, big, big you know, round of applause for him. They like the message. 
He goes to D.C. He meets with members of Congress, Republican members of Congress. They seem to be enthralled with him and like the message of, imagine what we could do together. You know, if I'm yes. president and you guys are in charge, what we could do. Kumbaya. Okay. Just like Wisconsin. Okay. And then he goes off to Oklahoma City and is one of, I think, three presidential, possible presidential candidates who speaks Southern to the Republican group. Leadership Conference. A uh, group of activists. Gets a great reception there. So it's going well. But there are all these things back home that Republicans are ripping apart his budget. Now, I mean, there's always grumbling about the budget, right? But I, talking to people, they have not seen this level of unhappiness and grumbling in the budget, especially transportation, that they can remember. So there's right. that going on. It's also fascinating is the default answer seems to be anymore from Republicans of, well, it's the governor's fault. So there's a bad piece of the budget, well, it's the governor's fault. Well, here's a little thing that the governor's people tell you, okay, the governor's on the ballot next year statewide. We know that for sure. Maybe presidential, we don't know. But not on the state ballot. But his policies will be part of the narrative. And if you're trashing them, that hurts the GOP brand. If your brand is hurt in Wisconsin, that hurts you next fall, okay. people in swing districts. So there's a little bit of a danger, if you will, in the governor's people's minds of constantly complaining about him and what he's done. Because remember, his coattails brought a lot of those folks along with him in uh, 2014. You know, 2014. It helped. 2014. The turnout, the turnout that Republicans are now, there's also a national wave, but he helped. You guys, it was politics. You also, you always pull the delegates. Mm -hmm. So, of course, Walker, our home field advantage guy, won. But once you took Walker out of the equation, who did the delegates like? Rubio, about a fourth of them. Okay. So, you know, we got 300-some delegates out of maybe 1,000 people who were there. So that's a decent sample size of what was there. But, yeah, Rubio was a quarter. But it wasn't like it was a runaway, not like with Walker, where Walker was 75% of the delegates who voted backed him, which isn't a big surprise. Maybe he should have been higher. But that's pretty good, healthy home, home field advantage, if you will. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Time for was politics stock uh, stock picks. So remember, it's a two weeks take. So uh, a yep. couple weeks ago, Governor Walker elevated Rebecca Bradley to the first Milwaukee court of County appeals. Circuit Judge to the Court of Appeals. Second time he was appointed to the court. First yep. time Milwaukee. Now the first court, this court of appeals. Um, we're all betting next year's going to open state Supreme Court race. Yes. Pat Crooks has said, "I'm still taking my time to figure this out." He's a man without a base. However, uh, who would run his race? Who would donate to him? That's a big question. So betting money is he doesn't run again. Okay. So Bradley now has circuit court and appeals court in a resume. It just kind of adds. Now, she cleared the big first hurdle was get, a, get the robe. If you have the robe, you could run for Supreme Court. If you don't have a robe, you have a hard time. Just ask Ed Fallone, uh, yes, for example, right. against uh, how difficult the, the that chief, is. The former chief, right? Uh, Marquette, yeah, ran against Chief Rogan, or Justice Rogan Sack in, uh, for the Marquette Law School. It's yeah. tough. It's tough, you yeah. know. Um, so she's got that on she's her resume. She's got the robes. So that's why she's rising. The question is, who's going to run? Mark Gundrum, former state lawmaker, I'm now in the Secretary's Court of Appeals. Right. He's well thought of as well. Um, Joanne Kloppenberg, who lost to Prosser in uh, 2011. There's a good bet she takes another run at the Supreme Court. So what I will tell you is I would bet money there will be a more interesting race next year, if it happens, Absolutely. than it was this year or Absolutely. the year before. I th okay, Bradley's a good choice. Mixed. The Bucks. Oh, this is package is time. on again, off again. It is crunch time. So we've been hearing there that all the people who are involved are finally going the same direction. You want to talk about moving parts. Go ahead. It's but in it's this Bucks inching, Arena funding. Inching and inching forward to get this thing done. Now, remember the president, Peter Feigen, I think you say his name, a month ago, 10 days. We had 10 days of this done. Well, that wasn't true. <laughs> but now we do have literally 10 days because it's got to be done by next Friday. Now, uh, can they get that in there, get everybody on board? It's a question. From what I've been hearing from people, it's a matter of, okay, they're in the same direction how to do this, but it's a matter of who pays what and how much and when. Okay. You know, how do you get these people on board? Okay, this is my share, and I'm okay with that. I've got revenue stream to, pick, to cover it, all that kind of good stuff. So okay. there's work to be done, but the sense is it's getting close. But those last few yards are always the hardest. Absolutely. And then falling. You know, Justice uh, State Abramson. Employees. Uh, State employees. Sorry, State, State employees. employees. So... We have not had a raise. We had, uh, we, most, we're not getting a raise this by any. Most state employees don't pay health care co-pays and deductibles. Mm -hmm. Do I have this right? Go back. So 1% raise this budget. Yep. No raise the one coming up. Yep. Go back four years. Uh, higher health care costs, higher pension costs. Now we have a package out this week that was approved by the Group, group insurance, insurance Board. board. To cost, save $81 million. Okay. Now, some of that might come from providers, but a big chunk is from employees are going to pay, they're going to see double uh, out-of-pocket costs, deductibles, all these things are going up. So if you're a state employee, you're going, okay, I'm not catching up financially with the lot hit that I took four years ago. Here's the thing, though, for state employees. 
If you're a lawmaker and you've got $81 million to spend, where do you put it? What's the political benefit of giving a state employee a raise versus giving your school district a raise? It's a tough, you know, it's a tough road place to be for these state employees who are not going to make out well in this budget. I think that's a wise choice. Okay, let's let's close this way. Uh, we talked about the, the the bucks package being one of the major things. Joint finance has to resolve if they want to have a budget by June one, which mm -hmm. is their goal. Mm -hmm. So the, I think there's at least three other things out yeah. there that they have. To, you want to go first? Which one? Transportation. Yep, transportation. Are they going to pass a fee increase and get the governor to veto it? Are they going to pass a fee increase? and uh, dare to veto and say, okay, if you don't want it, then you go ahead and cut the projects. Or do they stuck, go, okay, political reality is he won't sign a, a fee increase in the middle of a presidential campaign, so we're not going to do it, but then we cut the project. Well, if you cut the projects, you're the bad guy. Make the governor be the bad guy. Um, then there's always a question of do you try a veto override? If, he, if you do pass it, he does veto it. That's all, you know. To be Republican determined. Republican legislature overrides a Republican presidential candidate. I'm not candidate. saying it's the most likely scenario. A presidential but candidate. A couple of the ones who are really unhappy about it, yeah. they're gung ho. Let's do this. You know, mm -hmm. but I don't. Leadership, cooler heads might prevail before that, <laughs> you know, that happens. Okay, my turn. UW system funding. It mm -hmm. seems to me that they have reached under every cushion to come up with K 12 aides. There's. Do you. I'm, there may not be any easing of the 300 mm -hmm. million cut. To, to, the U, to the UW system per, that the governor proposed in February. Agree? Uh, there are people in the Republican caucuses who don't want to reduce the cut. They're right. not happy with UW. Right. They're also saying, you've got this big cushion out there in your reserves, which obviously UW says, hey, that money is committed. committed. It is not really just a, you know, a, cush, a cushion of you know, dollars laying there. Yeah. Republicans have talked about we want to reduce the cut, but what's left? Every day or every couple of days, they'll ask your clients, Bob, Bob Lang, how much we saved today? What are we at? And they'll tell them how much they're at. They'll score. They they'll score. Yep. What's left? That's the big question. They spent a big chunk of change in K-12. That was a priority. Right. Where else is it going to go? And when you do not change senior care, you lose an additional 15.5, 15, 15 16.5 million in GPR. I think the omnibus price tag was 21 million GPR upper altogether, roughly. Don't hold me to that one. But there have been increases elsewhere. Transportation? Do they try and direct some dollars, GPR dollars? There, all these questions to be figured out. Major questions. That uh, and finance is going to be twice this week, and mm -hmm. one of them is Friday. That could bleed into Saturday. Or they might come they, back on Saturday. Or too. they could 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 come back. They told on us Saturday. Wednesday and Friday for sure, and possibly right. Saturday because they won't be done by the end of the month. Wednesday end of the month, Sunday, May thirty first. Yep. So, you know that's right. That keeps on their time. I'm going to add one more: the stewardship uh, mm -hmm. argument. Do you stop buying steward, stewardship land to keep it from being developed? Because it's a very popular program. However, debt, uh, debt service is um, is the reason they're considering putting a moratorium on it. I'll add one more, the 999 motion. <laughs> yep. <laughs> that is the big question. It's always jammed full of interesting things, always comes out late at night in the last day. Yep. Always some surprises in there. Absolutely. Fascinating. I'm Steve Walters. And I'm J.R. Ross. That's Rewind for May 22nd.